Good evening, everyone. This is Pedro Castro and Jason Madel, deans over at Fenton High School. We want to talk with you this evening about FHS's restorative justice equity journey. Before we go into the journey, just wanted to give you an overview of our presentation. We'll be talking about some background data, some background, some data, and some research. Uh, we'll talk about what is restorative justice, how does restorative justice look at Fenton. We're also going to illustrate our equity journey through the use of restorative justice practices. Before we go into the actual presentation, I would like for you to consider this. The Alliance for Education published a report in 2013, which indicated a ninth grader who is suspended once increase, increase is two times more likely to drop out. So in other words, if a ninth grader is suspended from school one time, he increases the ability for that student to drop out of school from 16 to 32%. A second suspension for that ninth grader increases the risk of dropping out from 16 to 42%. So for this reason, we think about alternatives to suspension. We wanna be able to keep students in the building when it's safe and when it's doable. So um, here you have some statistics for Fenton discipline, Fenton discipline over the last nine years from 2010 through 2019. I do wanna highlight, which is highlighted there for 16 and 17 school year. In January of 2016, Senate Bill 100 went into effect. Although we started implementing some of Senate Bill 100 requirements in the fall of 2016, um, it was fully implemented, uh, at least the requirements of the, the bill in 2016 and 2017. So as far as traditional discipline, I just wanna explain what is that? So we here at Fenton use a traditional discipline system that was rooted in rules-based, uh, punitive, managerial, authoritative approach. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second that did not incorporate student input in terms of writing a wrong. I did want to make a distinction between student input here and student input as it relates to due process. When we talk about due process, students are in the dean's office for uh, a violation of a school policy or a violation of something that has not gone um, well or didn't go as a student planned. So we want student input uh, as far as learning what happened, their point of view, that's due process. This student input talks more about writing a wrong. We want students to be involved in the process so that they can learn from the mistakes and they can also be part of the process to be able to write that wrong. So second point here is that uh, quote from Urban Herb, student accountability fails in a system monitored by the teacher and void of student input. That student input is important for student accountability. Uh, without this opportunity, the behavior of the harm is repeated because the root or the initial concern has not been addressed. And this is where we get recidivism. We want to be able to address things uh, the first go around so that students don't make the same mistakes over and over again. So getting at the root. Um, third point, harm or misbehavior is perceived, is perceived as a violation of rules and laws versus a violation of people and relationships. This is key because we want to focus on individuals. We want to focus on their relationships with others. And if the focus is on um, students did not, for example, come to school on time, well, we talk with students about how does your not being in school on time, how does that affect others? So it's having the students go through all the steps of that. And sometimes we'll immediately say it was just me, but there's more to it. So we want to focus on the relationships and the people that are harmed when there is a misbehavior or harm that has happened. Lastly, the implementation of Senate Bill 100 requires that, student, that schools show student continued presence, that a student's continued presence in the building will create an eminent threat to the student, to others uh, and staff and or to the building uh, before any kind of suspension were to happen. From there, we go into the seven principles that guide restorative justice practice in education. And this is adapted from the restorative justice in education uh, article. Um, seven principles. The first one states, we want to meet student needs. That's exactly what equity is all about. Every, every student is an individual with individual needs. So we want to be able to meet their needs where they are um, in, it, whenever anything either good or bad happens. In this case, in the dean's office, when a harm has happened, we want to still be able to meet the student's needs. Second is we want to provide accountability and support for students. Even though a student ha may have harmed somebody else, there's that accountability that is important but we also wanna be able to support them even throughout that process so they can, again, learn from that. And the third point, tied into the second, we wanna make things right as best we can. So this will include the person who did the harm and the person who was harmed by that act. Um, we definitely wanna view conflict as a learning opportunity. So 
any anything that happens in the building, whether it's good or bad, it's an opportunity for a student to learn and we want them to be able to learn, uh, particularly from mistakes, so that they don't repeat those mistakes. We want to build healthy learning communities by having students being able to hold themselves accountable, we start doing that. By having students see how they have harmed somebody else and become part of that process to, to restore the, um, the harm that was committed, um, they are learning from that. Um, and we want to restore relationships. Um, that's the key to all this by having, by building those strong relationships, students can then feel accountable for what they've done for to others. And then again, address that recidivism we talked about a little bit ago. We also want to make sure that we address power imbalances as we talk about uh, equity. We want students who did not always necessarily have that voice to be able to, to um, speak up for themselves, to advocate for themselves. We are giving them that voice. We're giving them that capacity or building that capacity in them to be able to have their voice heard. Uh, again, basic principles of, equ of uh, equity also tie in to restorative justice. With that, Mr. Madel will tell us a little bit more about restorative justice. Thank you, Mr. Castro. So if we were going to break down restorative justice a little bit further, um, it is based on three core tenets. The first being what harm has occurred. The second being who was harmed. And the third would be how can the situation uh, be resolved in the most positive way for each party involved. And that is important because we are talking about how to resolve this um, in a beneficial way for the person who was harmed as well as the person who did the harming. Okay, so the question may come up, why restorative justice? Um, aside from all the reasons Mr. Castro explained, and there are plenty, uh, we have kind of broken it down to two major reasons, um, both equally important in my opinion. The first goal is um, designed to keep the students in the classroom. Restorative justice designed to keep the students in the classroom. Uh, exclusionary discipline impacts learning by removing students from the learning environment. So what are we saying here? We're saying that basically anytime we take the student out of the classroom or discipline, whether it's an out of school suspension, whether it's um, an in-school suspension, whether it's anything along those lines, anything that takes a student out of the classroom is going to impact their learning negatively. So our first goal is to develop a, um, a system of discipline that's going to limit as much as possible these exclusionary um, practices. Uh, the second goal is, as I said, equally as important. It's going to touch on um, a different type of, uh, of goal, um, and that would be the social emotional needs of our students. So what we have here is restorative justice is designed to meet student social emotional needs. Students develop an awareness and understanding of the other person's feelings and perspective. This process of coming together to address the situation fosters healing and restoration. So once again, uh, we are talking about empathy. We are talking about um, teaching a student to view a situation through the other student's eyes, uh, to understand that not everybody has had the same experiences, that there are these inequities and that we need to be cognizant of these and we need to be able to work with one another regardless of these inequities. And there is a way to work through confrontation without violence, without um, shaming, without bullying, without all of those things. And so that's the type of thing we're talking about as our second goal with restorative justice. So um, <clears throat> the impact of restorative justice is in that Restorative justice is active. It's going to be more effective in changing behavior, which is the entire goal of what we do up here in the Dean's office. Um, it's going to be much more effective because the student is actively working to change their behavior or to right a wrong. Whereas traditional discipline is simply a punishment, right? Um, it's passive, meaning the student has really no, no say, no active role at all in, um, in what's happening. You know, they're, they're sent to a room for 25 minutes to sit there. Um, a lot of times they're not going to be reflecting on why they're there as much as we love them to that that's not happening. So restorative justice allows for an individual to take an active role in the process of addressing and adjusting their behavior. And again, that is um, the most effective way 
you get a change in behavior, which is, of course, exactly what we're trying to do. So we're going to talk about this uh, graphic here on the side in a moment. But before we get to it, um, back to social emotional impacts, the crux of restorative justice is the building and maintaining of relationships. And that stands for relationships uh, among students and then relationships also between the adults and the students. Those are both equally important. Uh, these relationships allow both the individual who was harmed as well as the individual who did the harming to have input in the resolution of the situation. This allows us to work with the student rather than doing to the student. So um, this graphic here, this is called the discipline window. And this is probably one of the, if not the most important uh, idea with regards to restorative justice and equity. So we, you'll see that we have two axes here. The vertical is, ta is uh, talking about control, low to high, and the horizontal is talking about support, also low to high. You'll see that the one that is in blue probably stands out. Uh, that's the width. All right, so we'll get back to that one in a moment. That's our goal. We want to be with, with the student as we're working through something. The other three you'll see two, uh, not, or four, which are punitive, neglectful, and permissive, those are all inequitable. Uh, and there's a reason for that. Mr. Castro mentioned earlier that not all the students have the benefit of learning how to advocate for themselves properly. Um, those who have learned that have a huge advantage because they're much better at things such as conflict resolution, standing up for themselves appropriately, um, things of that nature. So each of our students have unique backgrounds, they have unique experiences. And so we need to be very aware of that and we need to meet the student where they are at. We need to keep in mind that although I know how to handle someone who spoke to me the wrong way or maybe even put their hands on me, there are many of us who, who don't know how to do that in, I guess, what we could call as a socially appropriate way. Um, their response may be to fight back, to hit, to any number of things, go on social media. We need to be aware of that all the time. And in the event that our students who are 14 to 18 years old um, and may not be able to really see that um, and have that empathy that we'd like them to have, they may not have developed that yet, we need to do that um, to help them do that. So we're going to do that with them. And when we talk about with, which you'll see is the restorative way, we're talking about basically walking with the students. And I say students because we're talking about a student that was harmed as well as a student who did the harming. We're walking with them to get to a resolution. Um, I do want to make it clear. Uh, there are certain very egregious offenses that we will not restore. Um, we will not walk with the students through it because it's not safe. Um, but in the majority of cases, we will do everything we can to get away from the doing to students um, and just handing out punishments and walking with them through the resolution. Okay, so this is another pretty important point. Um, there is um, I would consider it a misconception a little bit that restorative justice is just kind of warm and fuzzy and, and letting students uh, off the hook. And that's, that's not the case. Um, in fact, we view it as quite the opposite. We are forcing the students to be accountable for what they did instead of allowing them to just avoid it or pretend it didn't happen or worse yet, continue the behavior. So in order for restorative justice to be effective, it demands three things. The first is that um, something occurring that is wrong has been affirmed by the person. So if I did something, the first thing I need to do is admit that, is affirm that yes, I did something and that was wrong. Uh, the second thing is that I need to acknowledge that there was some harm. You know, Somebody was hurt in this. I need to make sure that I'm, I'm aware of that and I'm able to verbalize that. And thirdly, um, I need to accept responsibility. For, for what I've done and for who I've harmed. If I am not willing to do those things, restorative justice simply does not work. And it does need to be 
all three of them. None of those can be missing. So unfortunately, we do have to question what happens if the student is unwilling or incapable of doing what we ask or doing what restorative justice requires. And although this is not the route we want to go, um, the answer is simple. A student who's not willing to accept the parameters of restorative justice will receive the traditional consequences. And um, when having a conversation with the student about restorative justice, this is brought up and it is not in a threatening manner at all. What is said to the student is um, so-and-so, this is what happened, this is what we'd like to do. If you are unable or unwilling to take these steps to make this right, then um, the, the traditional consequence would be on the table and that's the route we go. However, we would prefer to avoid that and we would rather go the restorative route and do this, this, and this. But in the event that a student is not willing, um, there, there are still traditional consequences. So at this point, what I'd want to do, I'd like to do is just uh, summarize quickly our journey through Ed Fenson, uh, how we've gotten to incorporate equity, uh, some of the steps we've gone through along the way. So we started off talking about traditional discipline, um, how it was more punitive, more managerial, where we were telling students, okay, you did this, go serve a detention as if that detention will fix what the issue was, what the harm was. Uh, detention in and of itself will not fix anything, kind of like go to your room. That doesn't have a student reflect uh, on the process. So we, we started from there, Senate Bill 100, which is not something we did, but the state did to help us get to this point, uh, not just us at Fenton, but other schools in the state of Illinois. That led to our district now incorporating restorative justice uh, practices, trauma-informed practices, uh, SEL um, programs here within the building. Uh, consequently, Jason and myself have both been trained in restorative justice, and uh, we are actually both restorative justice trainers. So we can also train, and hopefully we, we can incorporate that here in the building and be able to train all staff here at Fenton. It is a building-wide process. It does, it does take some time and it takes some investment, um, but it is doable, um, and we look forward to doing that. That being said, we have, given that we've already been trained in this, we've already incorporated some of these, and there are some goals that we have for ourselves moving forward. One of the goals that we have is once we're back in the building, um, student panels where students are part of this process, kind of like the peer mentors that we currently have. We have had several restorative conversations with students where with the students who were the ones who did the harming and the students who uh, were harmed by the student where we come to a resolution and both parties are part of that resolution. Restorative circles uh, is another practice where we have several people within the, the circle to talk about how that harm has affected everyone there and how as a group, we can restore the harm and bring that individual who caused the harm back into the community. So from there, we go into where we are and how we've incorporated that. By having done these things, these, these components here, we have the student demonstrate individuality. And, and that's what this is all about. Every student is an individual. We give students their voice to be able to be heard um, and to hear uh, have others here if they have been harmed and be part of that solution process. Uh, we also hold students accountable. It is not, as Mr. Madel mentioned, this is not a free pass where, oh, you won't get a consequence. Uh, you just think about it and that's it. So there is an accountability and the stakes of accountability are much higher because it requires reflection by the student. Uh, and that reflection, we talk about social emotional learning. Again, another key part of the equity process. And last but not least, but actually most importantly, that's, this is why we're here in the building, academic success. By having this as a foundation for students, we build that capacity for students to be able to have social emotional success as well as academic success. We thank you for your time. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Mr. Middle and myself at the end of this PowerPoint, the next slide here, have all the references that we use in the making of this video. Uh, thank you again and have a good night. Thank you for listening. Thank you.